The West witnessed many pivotal turning points of bravery, misunderstanding, and cowardice. This one is bravery. A single, modest structure can be a legacy, a symbol and rallying cry for ones struggling for independence, the Alamo. Significant political changes were occurring in Mexico with Antonio Santa Ana becoming president in 1835. New policies were enacted that actually abolished slavery, angering the residents of Mexican-owned Texas, who were largely immigrants from the U.S., and many of them slave owners. Unrest flared until war broke out in October, and by December 1835, the Texicans had defeated the Mexican garrison, taking the sprawling three-acre complex, the Alamo. The acting Texican commander, Colonel James Neal, formally requested arms and men to defend the badly undermanned Alamo and was refused. However, Colonel James Bowie was dispatched with a modest 30 men. Later, Colonel William Travis arrived, followed by Davy Crockett. No reinforcements in any meaningful numbers ever reached the Alamo. While the Mexican forces reached 3,100 prior to the final assault on March 5th, the siege started with the Alamo defenders unprepared and Mexican troops under the dark moonless night getting to within musket range of the fort before being detected. Three separate waves of attacks occurred before the walls were breached. Colonel Travis was among the earliest killed. Bowie had previously fallen ill and was bedridden and likely killed in his cot. Two versions of Crockett's death have emerged. He surrendered and was later bayoneted and he was found dead with 16 dead Mexican troops surrounding his body. Casualty estimates vary widely, but what is accepted is four to 600 Mexican troops killed and between 182 and 257 Texican defenders. The battle was over by 6.30 a.m. All the bodies were bayoneted and stacked and burned. Strangely, three simple coffins were marked, Travis, Crockett, and Bowie, and then filled with ashes on March 2nd. Thanks to the bravery at the Alamo, Texas declared itself independent, forming the Republic of Texas on April 21st. Despite Santa Ana's overwhelming superiority in troop numbers, was attacked by the Texas Army and defeated at the Battle of San Jacinto, effectively ending Mexico's control of Texas. The Alamo is the most popular tourist attraction in Texas. It has been told in four feature-length films, scores of books, and even ballads performed by artists like Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, and Marty Robbins, and others. The Alamo quickly became a national symbol or rallying cause that reinforced the doctrine of manifest destiny and the country's right to own Texas and California. In the decade following the Little Bighorn in 1876, conditions worsened for the Indians living on reservations and skirmishes increased with both settlers and the military. Like most cult movements, misunderstanding and lies fueled the ghost dance, which started with a self-appointed messiah, a northern Paiute shaman named Wavoka. He grew up with a preacher-like father, and as a youth claims he had visions from God. The ghost dance movement was actually founded on many Christian beliefs, including that Christ will appear as an Indian. Wavoka claimed all Indians must adopt the dance and that all evils in the world will be swept away. The gospel encouraged coexistence with the whites. Prayers were for the return of the land in Buffalo. Peace with no more wars. This movement rapidly spread across the Plains tribes. 
seen here being performed among the Arapaho. As the movement spread, different interpretations emerged, especially among the Sioux, who chose to believe it meant the elimination of the whites. Tragically, the white Indian agents and settlers misinterpreted these events as encouraging uprisings. Troops were requested and sent to the Pine Ridge and Standing Rock reservations to enforce the ban put upon the ceremony. The agents told the military that Sitting Bull was a dancer and was resisting the band. In an effort to arrest him, there was a scuffle and the much revered Sitting Bull was shot and killed, ironically, by Indian police. It was a lie. Sitting Bull had nothing to do with the ghost dancers. One of the primary figures in the ghost dance was the Brule Lakota Sioux Short Bull, seen here, interpreted by Dave McGarry. After the death of Sitting Bull, Short Bull was arrested and imprisoned in Fort Sheridan, Illinois. In one of the great ironies of the West, Buffalo Bill Cody stepped in and convinced the military to release a select group of imprisoned Indians into his care to perform in his Wild West show, among them Short Bull. As a result of Sitting Bull's death, the overwhelming presence of the military and the repression of the ghost dance, 350 men, women, and children left the reservation to meet with others camped along Wounded Knee Creek. The following events can only be described as cowardice. With orders to disarm them, 500 troopers of the 7th Cavalry, which was Custer's old command, supported by four Hotchkiss rapid-fire field cannons, surrounded the band of Minikanju Sioux and began removing their firearms. Tensions increased, despite assurances that they would disarm peacefully. Unexpectedly, a leading ghost dancer began performing the dance after having told his most devoted followers that the special shirts that they wore would protect them against bullets. As events worsened, a warrior who was actually deaf and probably confused refused to relinquish his rifle, causing a struggle. A gun went off and it is still debated whose it was. Instantly, mayhem and gunfire broke out. Many of the Indians had already been disarmed with no means to defend themselves. The cannons opened fire. Fleeing women and children were cut down by the cavalry. In the end, scarcely 50 Indians remained alive. 300 died while the army lost 25 troopers, mostly to friendly fire. Scenes like this photo, collecting bodies of the dead Indians to be thrown into an open grave, reinforce the public's outcry. This dramatic scene by Frederick Remington says it all. The public wanted answers, especially since they had been assured the Indian Wars were over. The government and military cover-up was thorough, culminating in awarding 20 Medals of Honor, more than for any single engagement in our military history. This basically ended any serious conflict between the Plains Indians and the U.S. military. Ironically, American historians designate 1890 as the end of the American frontier. A staple of the Western experience, episode 13 explores the cattle drive, its origin, its importance, and what happens when things go wrong.